So to give you uh, an example, so two examples here. So number one is lending to two and, and lending to three, one unit. The units are not important. We can put, you know, different amounts here. But here in B, we also have three firms or three banks. Um, so here we, there is a principal lender and this principal lender is lending to two customers. Here, there is, there is a principal lender, and you can think of that this is a fictitious intermediary. Intermediary takes from one and passes on to the third. If third one defaults here, um, one is going to lose, and, but then this part of the relationship is going to disappear, but this part still survive. There is the number, number third, third firm, or ban. If this one defaults, then the whole thing is going to, whose whole thing is going to um, uh, dissolve. So um, the nature of the relationship, nature of the cross-sectional dependence, uh, is important. Um, at this point, we can ask the question: you know, whether whether it's this or whether it's this. I may have the information of the balance sheet. If I have the balance sheet information of, of, of each firm, um, you know, the assets and liabilities of each side for each firm, that may be sufficient for me, for me to, to tell what is the systemic risk, how the information is going to propagate over time. So in this paper, we will argue otherwise. Knowing the information uh, on the balance sheet is, not, is necessary but not sufficient to understand the nature of the nature of the systemic risk. So it's not good enough to analyze these entities um, individually. You have to pay attention to the nature of the cross-sectional dependence. Um, so, the, 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 so then the main, main question is then, if we need a quantitative tool set, how do I construct the quantitative tool set so that I measure the severity of each agent's potential default in a given network? Typically, like when we look at the literature, there are of course a number of different types of measures, but these measures uh, take one out and then analyze the rest. Taking one out is, is more like conditional. Here we're not taking anybody out, we're doing the analysis in a simultaneous set setting. So then, if this is the question, you know, how do we how do we quantitatively measure the severity of a default of a particular firm and how that project is off the network? Um, then we, we the, the, pro, the answer or the solution uh, has to be able to distinguish between different types of liability structures, and by looking at each agent's um, balance sheet is not going to is not going to lead to that identification. Like here, uh, you know, if, if, if the third one defaults, um, still part of the network survives, whereas if third one defaults here, the entire network um, uh, uh, disappears. And this is not the same severity. Like here, if this guy goes, the entire network doesn't dissolve, but here it does. So these are different types of se severities. Um, so then, what we are arguing here is that the liability profile uh, may not be sufficient. Okay, so what's happening in, in this particular one? The, there is a principal lender. This principal lender is lending one to each one of these firms. So he's lending three units, and the second and the third and the fourth are receiving one. So this is more like the, the liability liability profile. Um, but the same thing is happening here. The, uh, the first firm, bank, is lending three units, second one keeps one and passes the two, and then the third one takes two, keeps one, and passes one. Same, same type of uh, balance sheets. Um, balance sheet of the left and the balance sheet on the right is identical. But if four defaults, the propag 
propagation or how fast the network is going to default, dissolve is, is, is the severity is so different. So identical balance sheets, but the severity is different. How do we account for severity um, is the question. Um, yeah, so uh, how much, you know, do we measure the severity and how much the network that that agent is going to take with them is, is a type of measure. So this is our, our proposed solution. It's very simple, very intuitive. Um, so D is a weighted, weighted sum of bank I's uh, liabilities. There are N banks in the system. AIJ is how much the I T bank is borrowing from the J T bank. So this is non negative. So no borrowing, it's zero. Otherwise, if A is positive, that means that the bank I is borrowing from J. So if bank I is borrowing more, then the I is going to be higher. But at the same time, uh, the I simultaneously depends on the level of indebtedness that the that he is borrowing from. These are the the banks that, these are the other banks that the I bank is borrowing from. So, although bank I is not increasing its level of debt or, or um, liabilities, so A is not changing, it's the people that he's borrowing from are, their um, liabilities are increasing, then that, that also indirectly increases the, the liability structure of the I farm. So there is this simultaneous dependence that there are two things driving the network debt. Um, uh, network debt is not just your balance sheet. So this is basically your balance sheet. But our definition of network bank is not just your balance sheet. It depends on the balance sheets of the others. It depends on the balance sheets of the others. If you are facing those type of uh, banks who are heavily in debt um, or increasing their debt, that's going to increase your network debt. So in this definition, then, uh, there are two, open, two effects. One effect is that if agent I, bank I, uh, ends up having a higher debt through higher A, then that increases his, um, his weight, his, his network debt. But but if A is not changing for the same amount of old, um, if the other ones that he's borrowing from is increasing, that this one is increasing, although this is not changing, that also increases his network debt. These DIs and DJs have to be sold simultaneously. Um, so you can think of this as an N by N system. So the notion is very simple. Um, Now, so what, what we will see is that this is like a, because there are N firms, N banks, this is more, this is a vector. So this will be an um, eigenvector. This will be an eigenvector. This is a matrix, a JCC matrix. So we will have, so you can think of this as, as an eigenvector. This is the, um, the AIJs, where the eigenvalue is one. But we can allow for, say, uh, a scaling factor um, so that this will be the eigenvalue that we need to be we need to solve. Because here, uh, one doesn't necessarily be the eigenvalue in every case. So allowing for uh, lambda does not lead into any loss of generality. So then we have this uh, system where we we have to first solve and show the existence um, existence of, of a vector D where the elements of vector D are all positive. Um, so in our definition then is that um, uh, we, we solve, we need to solve for a positive eigenvalue. Once we solve for the positive eigenvalue, and that positive eigenvalue has to be such that it has to give us a positive vector of uh, Ds. 
And that D is called a network path distribution uh, because we normalize things. Because it's called a network path distribution, you can think of this as a, as a set of probabilities, those probabilities sum to one. Um, So, allowing for lambda, scale and fraction lambda, no loss of information, these sum to one, so it's, more, it's like it, because it sums to one, you we can interpret as probabilities. Because it's, if you can interpret as probabilities, that also means that we are basically measuring things in relative terms. And in our case, uh, because we are working with positive entries here, non-negative entries, um, we can use the Perron Frobenius framework, which is very useful, uh, which says that even that this framework basically says that if the elements of A's are non negative, then there will be a positive lambda. And that positive lambda, if you choose it to be the maximum modulus amongst all the eigenvalues, that is going to give us a D, where D is going to have post entries, which will be unique up to a scale. And that, that will be a uh, distribution. And that distribution is going to be well defined. Um, this type of framework, uh, this type of framework is not uh, totally new. Um, like uh, in the graph theory, uh, there are names to this, uh, lambda and d are called the maximum eigenvalue, maximal eigenvector of a graph. Um, for instance, in the case of the, this classic problem where you're trying to analyze the maximum clique problem, what is the maximum clique problem? Uh, you know, what is the largest group of agents who have a liability relationship with each other? What is the largest group of economists who are co with each other? What are the um, number of firms who do business with each other? So, in that case, lambda plus one is going to give us the uh, the maximum clique. Here's an example. Um, uh, so, they all have access to each other. First order of excess. Here, um, these three have excess. So, then what will be the maximum clique? It's going to be. Uh, lambda plus one, well, the eigenvalue of this is, is two, because the maximum eigenvalue is two, you add one, then it will give you the maximum clique. Similar type of thing for the Google's PageRank algorithm, they uh, determine the ranking of certain web pages, like in the case of uh, uh, Russia, I think it's um, this one. Um, so this is a relative ranking of who is um, the most important in terms of the level of connectedness. Um, so in that case, what you're doing is that you're calculating the maximum eigenvector. So basically, Google's page rank is basically the, the elements of that maximum eigenvector, which tells you, you know, which ones are the most important. So, I mean, there are examples in the literature, in other fields, that this is useful. But in our case, uh, it's a little bit more than that, that what we're interested in is that we want to get a distribution for D. D is going to tell us who is going to be the most vulnerable in the network. But at the same time, we, we wish to do some sort of a perturbation analysis. We want to do a robustness analysis where um, if one particular firm, one particular bank borrows a little bit more, a um, little bit less, if I do a perturbation along this network, how fragile is this network? Um, uh, is going to be, can I have an upper bound, can I have a lower bound in terms of how fast things are going to collapse. Um, so uh, the perturbation um, is important. So here's an example where uh, the relationship is on a ring network. That's the JCC matrix. You can calculate the eigenvalues, the, the largest maximum eigenvalue is this, and then you can calculate the, this is our D. Uh, D is the eigenvector. Uh, uh, but also we can interpret these as probabilities because they sum to one. So here we have four firms. So it's, they are all equally important, or if one of them goes, the whole thing goes. 
But if we had n uh, firms, of course, we will have n entries and then they will sum to one. Uh, so here, uh, there is a principal lender, three borrowers, if any of, any of them go, they take one third of the network. Um, if you change the amount, here, the amounts are one. One unit is lent by one to each one of them. If you change the amount, nothing is going to change. You will get the same uh, network uh, debt distribution, which is nice. Uh, if it is a line network, your adjacent matrix, these are your eigenvalues, this is your network distribution, it sums to one, it tells you that if this guy goes, he is the one which is most vulnerable. If he goes, the risk originates um, from this particular person in this setting. Now, what is important here is that this measure has to be a consistent measure. Um, so these theorems in the paper uh, sets out these consistencies so that this measure is a, it, it makes sense. Um, if a particular bank has zero liabilities, so if A I A is zero, then this has to be zero. So if you have zero liabilities, then your network debt is zero. But the, the other way is not true. Uh, you may be borrowing from a person, a bank who does not owe to anybody, so that that person's network debt is zero, still you can have this to be zero. Um, so this is um, one of the important parts of this setting. The second important setting is that if one firm increases its liabilities, um, then, and everything else is the same. So in some sense we have Two, two settings. Uh, um, first and the second, the, in the second, agent I increases its liability, everything else stays the same. If only agent I increases its liability, everything else stays the same, then uh, we will see that distribution is going to change in terms of the I agent is getting more weight. So this is again, is a type of an axiom which establishes the, um, the consistency of the measure. So this is, um, uh, I think, uh, is important to illustrate this theorem here. Remember, like here, um, uh, um, in this ring network, everybody is equally important. Everybody is equal, equal. It's, it's very homogeneous. But what happens if this guy uh, this, per, this bank uh, borrows a little bit more. There's an exogenous liquidity comes and this one borrows. What, what happens to the network distribution? Do one of them get more uh, important in terms of the uh, fragility? Um, so this example illustrates that. So th there's epsilon more, epsilon more. So when you add that epsilon more, that one over four, one over four, one over four changes. It, it turns out that the first one becomes more, takes more weight. Lambda is here greater than one. So it's, it's more like a, uh, there's a decay structure here. That homogeneity changes when you, of course, if you let uh, epsilon to get, go to infinity, right, then what will happen is that in relative terms, this is going to dominate. This will be the most fragile one. So the measure, the, this network that distribution measure is, is very simple, very intuitive, and I think it's useful. And this is how you calculate it. Uh, so this illustrates what I have just said, that you know, if, if, if one lambda, I'm sorry, epsilon is getting large, then this is going to dominate, this is going to be the most fragile one in the system. Um, the distribution D is differentiable. Um, so you can, you can, it's a smooth measure. Um, which is useful. Uh, so if you let one person borrow more, uh, you can uh, analyze the behavior of this uh, vector easily. Um, and then we have a number of other consistency results that this measure makes sense. If a bank increases its liability, 
but that increased liability is zero, then previous liability has to be zero. So this is like an axiom where it says that it's a, it's, it's a consistent measure. Um, this is, again, it's a similar type of notion um, in terms of the, uh, the consistency of the network. Um, uh, I think this one is uh, also quite useful. You can, it's, it's more like a comparative static type of thing. You say, well, I have a number of firms, some of them are borrowing more, some of them are reducing their liabilities. So some is increasing their liabilities, some, some of them are reducing their liabilities. Um, what, will happen to, what will happen to the economy? Is, 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 is economy going to get more risky? The fragility index is going to be more or less. Um, we can analyze those things. We, who's dominating? So this theorem is, is telling us um, uh, that type of comparative statics. And this is an example which illustrates that. One is borrowing more, one is, one is borrowing less. If that's the case, can I analyze what's happening to the stability of the network? The answer is yes. Um, of course, this measure has its limitations. Um, the limit, one of the limitations is that um, if you have two parts which are not connected, like this one, two components, still it looks like the ring network as if they're connected. So you have to be uh, prudent, you have to do a proper cluster analysis uh, to see the weak connections or to identify the stronger connections so that whatever that you're doing is, is robust. Um, so the measure requires uh, a proper uh, uh, cluster type of uh, study. Um, so what is the take from here? Uh, D is immediately computable. Um, I mean, you're looking at, say, 5,000 banks. Can you calculate the eigenvalues, eigenvectors? Uh, I mean, if you can calculate for the entire internet. So this is not an issue. This is, this is a computable measure, and I think it's a useful measure. But we're taking the uh, injections of liquidity as exogenous here. Um, so maybe if you wanted to push this a little bit further, um, you, how the network debt evolves over time in, in an economic environment, then maybe you, you may have to link that to a market equilibrium. So to, to endogenize the notion of, rather than letting the liquidity come in exogenously, if you put that within the model so that it evolves from there. Um, with that, with that point, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robo. Uh, any questions, please? One question. Uh, what do it mean? I means that if there are if there are let's say four banks and I am interested in analyzing the first bank minus I means the remaining second third and the fourth banks rest of the system minus I summarizes the behavior of the rest of the system what happens if a particular bank increasing its liability relative to everybody else. What happens to the fragility of the system? Okay, any other questions? Yeah, actually. Anyway, um, so just a quick question. And, um, thanks. Yeah, just a quick question. I was just, I just want to ask uh, if you have tried 
consider uh, banks on reserves because sometimes the bank has some some reserves which could compensate for the default of one or maybe several small borrowers. So I just want to ask whether you could incorporate this into this the, the system, the scheme, if you try this. Because, uh, I mean, as far as I can consider, I'm very interested to model the European risk of the situation with the French banks uh, holding some assets of the Greek banks and all the situation around it. But um, the big question is if the bank could sustain some of the defaults or not. Yeah. Um, I mean, let me, let me answer it this way. Uh, so the, the punchline is that if we look at the, um, the balance sheet, balance sheets of each firm or each bank independently, uh, that doesn't really account for the, the pro propagation of the liability structure, how that disseminates over time. Um, those were the two examples, you know, you have one, it gives you the same type of distribution of the liabilities, you have the other, that one also gives you the same, but if one defaults, in situation is different in one case, if one defaults in the other, the whole thing goes. Um, so, I think, I think it is important, it is important how to link these balance sheets to each other. What is the nature of the dependence between these balance sheets with each other, rather than just a statistical measure, rather, rather than a statistical summary? But then, that comes to your question, what is it that am I going to calculate? What, what, is, what is it that I have to take into account in terms of who is a net borrower and who is a, who is a net lender? Um, that part, I think, you, you have to decide how, how you want to account how the reserves come into play, um, whether the reserves really come into play in a given type of time scale, how your time scale is going to matter, whether you have access to your reserves or not. Um, so this paper uh, is, is, I think, is, is a tool set, doesn't tell you about that, but that's something that as a regulator you have to decide um, what numbers that you have to put in the network. Um, yeah, but I just want to ask, do I understand correctly that the default of any borrower should result in the default of the lender? Is that correct? The way I interpret it. That's so if, the, if the, there's a lender and a couple of borrowers, the default of any borrower, irrespective of the amount of, uh, that it borrowed, should, should result in the default of the lender. That's not that's not true, right? That's not what we've said. The, uh, the, the, the what we're saying is that uh, the propagation, regardless of the balance sheet, depends on the nature nature of the nature of the connectedness, the nature of the propagation mechanism. How fluid the propagation mechanism is. What is the distribution of the network debt? If if the network debt is Concentrated on a particular, particular type of entity, um, you know, you have the weight is almost one on a one particular entity. You knock out that type of entity, then of course the whole thing is going to go. But uh, if 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 the network debt is distributed across, uh, no, I mean a different thing. If if I have uh, so the lender, for instance, a bank. And it's borrowers, so the, the, the company or bank or guy who borrowed from that bank, if that borrower defaults, the bank also should default in this situation. No, the, if there's a direct link between those two, the one step link, no? I, no, no, that's not true, but maybe we do it after. Right, anyway, yeah, maybe I need to Yes. Right, thank you very much. Interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, when I listened to both uh, the presentation, both your papers, that in fact uh, one area of future research could be combining both. I'm sorry, by uh, combining both, both ideas. Because the first one is more related to uh, qualitative characteristics. 
the um, relative riskiness, whether it's the supplier, supplier demand of credit. But the second one is more of an alternative measure, a simple measure, very clean, very straightforward measure of, um, should I say, character, uh, characterizing the importance of an entity or a network. Now, on the second one, um, uh, clearly, one, one area I could imagine being very uh, exceedingly interesting to investigate would be that the way it's currently defined, diagnostic to, should I say, the ability of a lender to absorb a shock. Um, everybody basically, you, you, remember you control for the degree of severity of, uh, or the degree of lending, but the upstream or downstream vulnerability depends really also on the balance sheet of the individual entity. So in other words, if I'm number one in your network, yeah, I have a very robust balance sheet, I might, the network might be very vulnerable on my existence, but I can handle quite a shock. Whereas I might be number three, I get a lower contribution in terms of vulnerability to the network, but I have a very, I'm very thinly capitalized, I have very little tolerance for shock. So overall, if I would control my, my uh, eigenvector for the balance sheet strength, that could potentially, in the limit, have an offsetting component or offsetting effect on your overall vulnerability measure. And the way you can inform that would be actually take your first paper, and take basically your your adjacent matrix as a conditional matrix for your vulnerability. I was wondering whether that's an idea you would um, investigate potentially. Yeah, that, that, that's an thank you. That, that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent idea. I mean, the, the second one is basically a very new paper. Um, uh, we just finished it about about a month ago. I think this is the second time that I'm presenting. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll certainly take that into account. Thank you. Sure. Questions from students? Okay, so, um, so I'd like to thank you very much.